Good morning, and Yang Haseo, everybody. Uh, I'm pleased to hear to talk to you today about uh, the implications of the Biden administration's Buy America and American manufacturing to the biopharma industry. My name is Danny Peters, and I'm the president of Magnet Strategy Group. We provide services to life sciences organizations um, with an interest in government, both the United States and Canada. Since President Biden was sworn in on January 20th, the administration has introduced a variety of proclamations and proposals to support domestic manufacturing and to encourage procurement of domestically produced goods for infrastructure. However, it's important to note that some of these sentiments occurred before the Biden administration in the Trump administration. In order to prepare for strategies in the United States in relation to um, it by America and American manufacturing proposals, it's important to make a difference between positions taken by the administration and actual policies in, in action. It's also important to note the activities taken by the life sciences industry in the United States that will likely lead to a more balanced approach, recognizing the complex nature of the global pharmaceutical supply chain, the need for efficiency and cost management in the pharmaceutical sector. Here, I will outline some factors uh, for your attention and discuss other topics such as drug pricing and opportunities for our companies um, in the life sciences sector in Korea to look forward to in the United States. The first item I wanted to discuss with you in terms of a, a proclamation is the Executive Order 14001 relating to a sustainable public health supply chain. In this proposal, um, the administration has asked the government to, pre to prepare a strategy that to design and build a long-term capability in the United States to manufacture supplies for pandemics and biological threats. Of course, this has, this has arisen um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the idea of, of the, or the need for domestic infrastructure to respond to both the current pandemic and future pandemics. Within this strategy, the, the government has to respond within 180 days. Um, and included within that strategy, they have to look at foreign supply chains and look to strengthening uh, and options for strengthening better coordinating global supply chains. So with that, uh, we see an opportunity for uh, the administration to understand the complex nature of the global pharmaceutical supply chain, um, how integrated it is, and how potentially uh, challenging it might be and costly, and, and also um, undermine public health security to locate all, all domestic manufacturing um, and the need really for integrate with allies. Uh, the next item I wanted to bring to your attention is the Bio-American Executive Order. And of course, this has received a lot of attention. Again, what's important to note is that an executive order is a proclamation. What's important to see is what follows through with government policy. So this sets forward the intention of the administration. And, and of course, what's important to note is that it encourages the government to purchase products made in America. We have to note uh, trade agreements as being an important factor here. And so with, you know, with how we see how policy plays out, um, how, how it's going to align with, with trade agreements with, uh, with US allies. Uh, we have to note that um, US made is, is a factor here and it actually preceded by administration and the Trump administration in the final days of the Trump administration. Uh, new regulations we were um, put forward that would change the allowance of domestically manufactured materials that would be, um, that would be um, known as, as US made products. And, and then we see actually in the executive order uh, with the with the and under the Biden administration, um, it will be harder to secure waivers um, from foreign manufacturers that would be that would classify products as U.S. made. So, so this is um, something that we have to note to see again with the Trump administration regulations. Um, those will likely continue, and also even a, um, a higher burden for determining U.S. Uh, made products. Also, what's interesting in the Biden executive order is um, they are proposing to create a website 
that would state all uh, foreign suppliers under contracts and provide an opportunity for uh, U.S. businesses to see if contracts awarded would could be um, substituted for U.S. businesses. Um, what's, what's something that is important to note, under the Trump administration, an executive order was put forward uh, focused specifically on a Bioamerica for pharmaceutical products. So we have not yet seen that um, with the Biden administration. This is something that we should certainly watch. Um, but something I have noted is that um, trade, trade associations in the pharmaceutical industry have been very active on this issue, raising awareness, um, both in the previous administration and this administration, about the, the undue burden that it would cause on supply chain security um, and also costs in terms of healthcare costs. If, if, if all of the uh, manufacturing would be located in the United States and if similar Buy American provisions would apply. Um, and I think in terms of then we have to look at the, uh, the infrastructure package that the Biden administration has put forward, the American Jobs Plan, which is, which is $2 trillion. Uh, um, again, it's a plan that's going to be submitted to, to Congress for further, um, further action in, in legislation and funding. Um, and in the, in the jobs plan, it does indicate that the president will ask Congress to include a commitment to increasing American jobs through Buy America provisions. Um, it, right now, Buy American provisions are in place for iron, steel, and other products uh, currently incorporated into infrastructure projects. So again, we'll see how this translates into pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing. But as I just stated, there, there, I think there are some challenges there. And in practice, uh, we might see a more measured approach. So some other items I want to talk about. Uh, so infrastructure actually is relevant um, in the context of drug pricing. So Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi has indicated that negotiating drug pricing uh, might be seen as a tool to raise funding to cover the, the, the large price tag of the infrastructure package. Um, so this is something to continue to watch uh, to see if, if this um, is a, a, a proposal that the Democrats will uh, follow through with in order to finance infrastructure packages. But other items I thought it'd be important to look, look out for in, in legislation and, and packages that the Congress is working on to address drug pricing. One of them is, of course, on COVID-19. So there's a variety of different bills um, that they are looking at right now that um, you know, some deal with supply chain security, others deal with uh, ensuring coverage for uh, COVID-19 therapeutics um, for Medicare populations. Um, so again, COVID-19 is going to continue to be with us for a while and, and looking at um, drug pricing and, and, and coverage under COVID-19 uh, therapeutics is something for certainly to watch. The next item is, is rare diseases. So we're seeing a number of different bills uh, being introduced um, to address uh, exclusivity of rare diseases um, and other measures. Um, and it, it is trying to address the, um, the, the price tag associated with rare disease um, medication. So these are um, items that seem to be uh, trending and, and to watch in the, in the weeks and months ahead. So I wanted to then to talk about opportunities because you might look at the, 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 the proposals around uh, Buy American and the need for a domestic production and manufacturing life sciences and think, well, if I'm, if I'm, a, if I'm a company um, in Korea, how, how do I find those opportunities? And still there are really notable opportunities to look forward to. Um, so one is actually, and is increasingly in the news, is, is establishing this new agency. So it's Advanced Research for Products uh, for health agency. It's modeled after, in some cases, under DARPA, which is a, a government agency within the Department of Defense, focus on breakthrough, um, br breakthrough solutions. So in this case, the breakthrough solutions for health. It seems to be the focus is going to be um, initially on um, uh, cancer and diabetes, and, and is supposed to really address the valley of death issues as well. We know we have the National Institutes of Health that's looking at um, early stage discovery work and through to some translation work. Um, ARPA would, ARPA H would take on some of that work too, but focus on really breakthrough and getting products into the marketplace. 
So certainly those won't be limited to U.S. companies. And as you're developing novel solutions um, and looking at partnerships, this is um, this is a new agency, $6.5 billion in, in the president's proposed budget. Um, so something to look forward to. Something to note, again, which looks as a challenge, but also potentially an opportunity in, in the infrastructure plan proposed by the Biden administration. Um, they're trying to encourage domestic investment by removing foreign derived intangible income. Um, so it is supposed to be used as a tool to incentivize um, uh, investment in domestic infrastructure. But again, as, as, as you are a biopharmaceutical company and you're looking for partnerships in the United States um, and looking to partner with that infrastructure, um, that might be an opportunity to look forward to. Uh, the National Science Foundation is another uh, government agency doing breakthrough um, research and, um, and systems. And so the National Science Foundation, $50 billion, that's in the infrastructure plan. So we'll have to see how that translates into actual funding um, awarded through Congress through the, um, the infrastructure um, legislation that they'll work on. Uh, other tools, uh, $40 billion for research infrastructure and $30 billion for, for funding in, our, in rural areas. So again, lots of funding to, to look forward to. Uh, again, we'll see how it translates into, into the actual package funded by Congress. The other item I wanted to bring to your attention is, is this funding, proposed funding, $30 billion to protect against future pandemics. And this is for manufacturing and R&D. Uh, in the more recent COVID package that passed Congress, there was $10 billion um, uh, set aside to support this work under the what's called the Defense Production Act. And um, that, that is being used in practice to support expanded uh, domestic manufacturing, um, enhancing uh, domestic supply chains um, to respond to the current pandemic and future pandemic. So, uh, so if you are a company and you are looking at potentially expanding your operations in the United States and, and bringing your technology here, um, this is a fund to look out for. Um, and, and again, in the proposed package and the infrastructure package, um, they're looking at additional $30 billion on top of the $10 billion that's in that fund. Um, the funding mechanisms that are being used for that, um, look, looking at the Department of Health and Human Services, um, likely under the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, and under the Department of Defense, there are a couple different offices that are coordinating this funding. So if there's an interest, those are places to look out for. And I just highlight some of these government agencies below. Um, these are agencies where, as a foreign company, you are um, open to you know, working with. Um, and I'll get into a next slide. Also, if you work with partners such as universities or, or other U.S. commercial parties, um, can even, in some cases, enhance your, uh, your, your competitiveness for those opportunities. So these are all agencies, and there are others, but these are all agencies uh, to look out for in terms of um, partnerships. This is just, this is a slide, this is from Politico that came out um, on Friday, but this just to give you a sense of the, the government funding uh, sphere and, and, and what things look like for the uh, proposed uh, uh, um, fiscal year 2022 uh, budget um, in terms of what's being requested from Congress. Uh, you can see the Department of Defense is uh, quite, quite large compared to the other agencies, but Department of Health and Human Services is, is significant as well. And of course, Health and Human Services funds a lot. They fund Medicare, they fund the FDA, they fund the CDC. Um, but it is worth noting that the National Institutes of Health um, is, has a $51 billion um, request to Congress for funding this year. And that's a $9 billion increase from last year. Uh, that's quite sizable. And, and for those that are interested in, in working, with, um, working with the NIH uh, biomedical research, um, something to look forward to. So in my closing slide, I wanted to talk about uh, opportunities, building opportunities in the United States and steps that you can take to, to do that. And um, of course, the first one is to look at aligning strengths with gaps. Um, there's so much exciting technology happening in South Korea right now in the biomedical industry. Um, so many areas where, where companies can play a competitive um, position. And so understanding where the gaps are in the life sciences marketplace and aligning um, your, uh, your value proposition with those gaps is the first, first step. 
Uh, something to look at, I've worked with my other uh, clients um, in Asia, is setting up an office within a local U.S. city. Um, and, and this is, I mean, obviously in COVID, it's a, t it's a difficult time to travel, but when things open up again, it's a great way to um, build those networks, uh, facilitate those partnerships. And, and then again, in this in this increasing consciousness around U.S. production and U.S. presence, um, that, that kind of factor can make a difference, um, particularly as you advocate uh, on behalf of your, of your organization. A quick, easy tool to also to enhance your voice is to join uh, trade associations. So I mentioned before that uh, trade associations in the life sciences industry, like bio or pharma, have been active on this on this topic of you know Bioamerica in the pharmaceutical sector and and raising awareness about the, the complex nature of the pharmaceutical supply chain and and really the need to continue to work with foreign partners to ensure that security, that sustainability um, and, and efficiency. So joining, if you have not joined those organizations, are important way, you know, working with Korea Bio and, 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 and coordinating with other counterparts in the United States uh, could be a way to enhance your voice within those forums. Uh, research partnerships are the best way to, um, to build upon those partnerships. Uh, university labs. Um, there's so many, so many different universities that are that are doing interesting work. And even if you're working with uh, an organization in 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 your in your country in Korea, uh, bridging those ties between universities can be a way to uh, potentially build opportunities in your own country as well as um, as well as in the United States. Um, commercial. I'm sure these are uh, these are opportunities you're already looking at. Um, but as I mentioned before, in terms of the incentives that the administration is trying to put forward around domestic manufacturing, uh, perhaps looking at areas where you know, your manufacturing could, could, could there be a complementary manufacturing in the United States or other forms of production that could um, enhance opportunities. And then I want to mention consortia. So I, I talked a lot about the National Institutes of Health. The National Institutes of Health, as well as Department of Defense, um, they fund a number of different consortia looking at a variety of different um, uh, therapeutic areas and goals. And the consortia are often comprised of both um, in the university sector, but also with groups like CROs, CMOs. And partnering with consortia can be another way of, um, again, you're working with a US-based uh, collection of, of groups. And, and by doing that, you can access um, government sources of funding, um, but also it, it brings you that credibility, that technology, and can enhance uh, commercial partnerships as well. So depending on the, the area that you're focused in, um, there's, there's so much happening you know, from, from, from cancer to kidney disease disorders, there, there's a lot. So um, look for those um, opportunities to build, um, build, build connections. And then finally, building alliances on, on advocacy initiatives. Um, one of the things about the United States that's wonderful is just a very vibrant um, advocacy environment um, on, on when you look at you know, various different patient organizations working on all sorts of disease areas. Um, it's, it's such an active climate and it's a, it's a great way of getting a feel of, of the U.S. advocacy environment and the policy issues at play and, and also a way to, to build those connections and to in, enhance your, your your voice in those areas. So whether it is on in a, in a disease area or on an issue topic such as tax or trade, there, there is so much happening. So looking at those issues that you care about and, and find those organizations are ways that you could build opportunities. So I hope that you found um, this helpful and uh, here's my information. Um, you feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And um, in closing, Kamsa uh, Hamida. Anyo Haseo. I am Dennis Nash with Individual Analytics. We are a unique uh, digital health company here in the United States, building a platform to help deliver the best care through doctors and patients around the world. I've been asked to help Korea Bio discuss digital healthcare device and reimbursement processes in the USA. I am happy as a follow-up to answer any questions that anybody might have. The agenda that we're gonna cover is understanding US reimbursement for home connected care. We're gonna cover the 
areas where there's opportunities for devices in the U.S. market. We're going to talk about the most promising applications of those devices, how physicians and hospitals and the patients fit into that ecosystem. And we're going to talk about an example of that using Individualytics to share a story of what we've learned. And again, happy to answer any future questions uh, later on. So an important understanding is the U.S. healthcare market itself is, is very complex. Most of you probably have a little bit of experience with that, but with digital health, it's even more complex because it's fairly new, uh, roughly starting about five years ago. I'll explain more. But the concept that's being developed in the U.S. market is a connected care, real-time electronic communication between a patient and a doctor and nurses. And it includes telehealth, which is like a televideo between a doctor and a patient. It includes remote patient monitoring, collecting data from the patient at home, at least daily, sometimes more frequently. It includes secure email and other uh, both asynchronous and synchronous communications between the provider and the patient. And this whole system uh, here in the U.S. is has been moving forward on that. And with COVID, it has moved forward even faster. And so you, you got to understand in the billing model that we're going to talk about, remote patient monitoring refers to FDA devices, so regulatorily approved devices to collect data about a patient's health attributes, and it has to be connected in real time to bring that data back and share it with the providers. And then the expectation is you're going to take action on that if it exposes any issues like uh, blood pressure too high, for example. Um, what I've come to learn, and I'm going to share this in more detail, is you really have to understand what is driving the U.S. healthcare industry to make this a reality. And, and there's still challenges, and uh, I personally believe, and there's a lot of evidence to support this, it's only going to grow in terms of reimbursement levels and opportunities. Um, but we're in our infancy of really making this work, and COVID pretty much has made it. It's not going to go backwards. It's only going to grow and you have to understand reimbursement codes, which are complicated into themselves. And largely those reimbursement codes are connected to diagnosis codes, you know, in this case, chronic conditions, and then CPT billing codes. These are the insurance codes that everybody in the US healthcare industry use to say, here's what service I'm delivering to get paid. We'll cover all of that as it relates to digital health. So underlying this, transformation to digital health is the overall U.S. healthcare has uh, exploded in terms of how much money is needed to support healthcare in the U.S. And as you know, we are a market-driven capitalistic society, and we have chosen to have lots of different insurance players in that market to deliver the reimbursement for care that tends to be mostly local. Sometimes it's not, but most of it is local. And it's gone from 23 billion in 1960 to 3 trillion. The three biggest components are hospital costs, clinical care, and medications. And if you look at a 50 year run rate, it's been a 9% annual growth rate. But what you're seeing in the last about five to six years is about a four to 6% growth rate. Part of that is inflation is down, but part of it is implementing uh, forms of digital health that is wrapped around something called care management, delivering care uh, electronically at home or connected care. And what is really pushing this to the next level is uh, there's 58 million people in the U.S. with multiple chronic conditions. Um, and they represent 75% of the cost. So you got roughly 40% of the people representing 75% of the cost and largely the hospitals and the insurers have learned if you got chronic conditions, especially multiple, I have to help the patients at home every day, every month, as opposed to when they show up in the hospital or the once a quarter doctor visit, which is normally how often they would see a, a primary care physician here in the US. So that's, that's really the underlying aspect of what's driving digital health in the United States. Um, and that's where the reimbursement codes are currently set up to pay for.
I believe that'll get extended over time, but that's where the money is right now. Um, connected to digital health are other major changes. One is the idea of quality, delivering good care the first time and not having uh, to do it again. So here in the US, if I were to do a surgery on you and you go out to your home after the surgery and come back, if that readmission could have been avoidable, you don't get paid for it. So the US is really reinforcing the idea of do it well the first time and the definition of well keeps getting you know, better defined. Uh, electronic health records uh, in the last 10 years have become ubiquitous and it is at the point today where if you are providing services and you are not connected to an electronic health record, you don't get paid. So even though we don't have a national health system per se, um, we, we have uh, a national system for collecting data and sharing data and it keeps getting better each year. Another interesting aspect is mental health used to be off on the side. It is now fully integrated and from an insurance industry standpoint, considered to be uh, at par with physical health. So as you think about your digital health strategy on physical health, which is the area that's mainly reimbursed right now, just know that at some point mental health integration is important. Evidence-based clinical care is at the foundation of what gets funded. And so if you're bringing a device or an application into the US market, you're gonna to need to validate its outcome value um, or that it's similar to something else that already has been validated. But that's the fundamental element of uh, how things get uh, paid for is that FDA approval and certain clinical outcomes have been validated. And then the other interesting thing is uh, our system has moved probably about between 10 to 20 percent of billing now is through a value-based compensation model, which is different than the traditional fee-for-service model. And now I, as a doctor or as a health system a hospital, I can get paid a set number of dollars per month and then as long as I stay below a certain target level for that patient, whatever I save between that target and what we really spent, I get that back as a bonus payment. And this is growing, but most doctors, to be honest, are still more comfortable with the fee-for-service model. And it turns out um, the bigger companies that have tried this have made small amounts of gains uh, per patient, but when you add that up across a big population pool, that can turn into millions of dollars of incremental profit for a doctor group or a hospital system. So there, there's a wave of, of uh, transition going on to value-based, uh, higher quality service. And also the idea that all of the pricing um, and your success in delivering good services, those types of information are starting to get shared more broadly, what I call transparency. So that is another aspect of things you wanna consider as you move forward. Don't just rely on fee for service, but recognize the, the new game going forward is how do I support value-based and sharing information with the patients and all of the different uh, provider groups. And then COVID-19 has totally changed digital health. It's, it's accelerated telemedicine adoption here in the US and it's being well received, especially in the multiple chronic condition patient area because of the high cost. And so the, the real need is to how to deliver that at scale with great devices. And I'm hoping, you know, those of you that are listening have strategies to bring great devices to the U.S. market. Um, the priorities in the U.S., uh, number one is to protect and improve health. Uh, number two is to improve utilization cost. And again, back to the charts I just showed, that, that's around reducing hospital uh, visits, ER visits, uh, hospital stays, basically utilization cost in the hospital, reducing the number of primary care physician visits a year, specialist visits. Um, medications are deemed to still be too high, and there's an opportunity there, depending on who you talk to. It's uh, as low as 10% and maybe as high as 50% cost reduction opportunities. And then you got the major trends of an aging population. We, we're living longer and the longer you live, the, the odds are you're gonna get a chronic condition. Um, doctors and uh, healthcare specialists in the US are 
uh, always undersupplied. Uh, demand is way more than we can find people and train people. And so things that help make their time more productive is high value. Um, there is a disparity here, uh, primarily around um, socioeconomic uh, perspectives. So the goal is how do we bring additional elements to the care relationship? So examples are social care. Um, even though my, you know, your device is focused on healthcare, uh, sometimes people need support. You know, that could be being able to talk to a nonprofit around your disease in the area of Alzheimer's, to use as an example. Um, this is called social determinants of health in the U.S. And it is also growing in need. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as just helping get the patient able to see their doctor either physically or through a telehealth connection. Some people don't have the technical skills. Some people lack access to the internet, roughly, that's less than 1% of the population right now. But these are little barriers that if you have a social economic challenge, uh, make good care hard and technology could be part of that answer. Um, and then the, the last one is new, but nearly all of the health systems and doctor groups have seen firsthand how their normal flow of fee-for-service care reduced during COVID-19. So they would like to see a more robust model between continuous digital health care, continuous reimbursements and payments, even when a pandemic happens. So these are, these are all the drivers that as you think about your digital health strategy that are really ways of adding extra value and differentiating yourself in the US market. Um, going just a little deeper into that is the, the main um, delivery of care model in the United States is still really acute care excellence, especially when you think about rolling up and connecting up with a hospital system, which nearly all doctors do. Uh, probably less than 10% are not associated with a doctor or with a hospital, excuse me. So nine, over 90% of our care model ultimately connects up through a hospital, even though there are a lot of independent elements of that. And what's really going on is chronic conditions has really become the main cost driver. Um, six out of 10 people and adults in the US have one chronic condition and 40% have two or more chronic conditions. And those with two or more are costing $2.7 trillion, over 75% of the cost for 40% of the market. And the expectation is that particular 2.7 trillion is gonna double over the next 10 years. So as you think about your, the digital health market and the key variables you might wanna measure and maybe the software that you wanna put around it, just, just remember that the big cost driver is the two or more chronic conditions. And there are opportunities in the single chronic condition and in what is like wellness and disease prevention, not inside of the um, health insurance industry, but more on employee uh, care model those are all, those all exist. And, and to me, they're all part of a continuum for the digital health market of how to play. But the biggest money is helping two or more chronic condition patients. That, that, that's where all the funding and diagnosis codes and billing is lined up. Um, so the thing that is of high value, I think for digital health companies to consider is uh, there's a, a website called patientslikeme.com that you can check where patients self-report how medications and treatments are helping them around their various diseases. And it happens to line up with clinical trial data of drugs. So the average chronic disease medication on its own only is 20% effective where it gets a high response to let's say control blood pressure without any side effects that makes it so I have, you know, I'm nauseous or I have to go uh, to the bathroom a lot. So if you start with the understanding that the current treatments um, don't work 80% of the time, and then if I have two or more treatments, they work less than 95% of the time, that is a big opportunity for digital health to inform the patient and the doctor and the nurse and all the other care team members uh, what's working, what's not working, how to help the patient get better faster, and, and that's really what the mission is of digital health 
uh, around these multiple chronic condition patients. And you can see they take a lot of prescriptions. Um, there's been lots of research here in the US to show that digital health education and motivation, uh, when you compare that to drug alone, has improved outcomes by 2x or more. Uh, a big um, billing code areas related to this are called remote patient monitoring or RPM and chronic care management, uh, CCM. This is part of a, a continuum of billing codes and services called care management. It's, it's, the, it's the connected care or virtual care for a patient at home. And the main things that it has shown so far over the last five years of this billing being available is a reduction of uh, emergency room visits. Uh, one study showed 2% reduction on average, uh, reduced hospitalizations, that means uh, fewer people getting admitted and staying uh, a shorter stay. Uh, depending on which study you look at, it is saved anywhere from $500 to about $1,500 per year on average by doing RPM and CCM. And there's, there's still a physician adoption gap and it comes down to kind of the evidence-based uh, medicine concept that I spoke earlier is studies have shown and um, our actual customer dialogue is around 90% of the doctors are looking for solutions that can go into the home and into the patient's lives and actually get better care than they can when they come into the office. So there's still a feeling by 90% of the doctors that a video telehealth call alone is not sufficient to deliver better quality care. So as soon as COVID, um, uh, you know, more and more of us get vaccinated and it, and it gets to some new normal, the doctors are actually gonna be asking patients to come in. Our job together is to create digital health solutions that says the care at home is better than the care they can get in the clinic or maybe a hybrid model of the two. So back to the reimbursement models. In the US in 2015, Medicare uh, rolled out the first care management billing code for chronic care management, CCM, is $42. It still exists and largely the doctors and the payers like it because it reduces utilization costs. Uh, in 2018 and 2019, it got expanded with remote patient monitoring. Um, again, the idea is I have, uh, let's say a, a hypertension patient that needs blood pressure measurements, as long as I collect 16 measurements uh, or more per calendar month, I can get paid uh, approximately $60 to help that from a technology standpoint and roughly uh, another uh, $90 or so for services and actually having somebody monitor that and manage the alerts and help the doctor with better care. So if you look at industry averages right now, uh, that $42 has been used by 10% of the doctors. And, you know, everyone I've talked to says in general, the patients like it. In general, the nurse that's delivering that care likes it, but it has not shown uh, a way to actually improve the health outcomes. It has improved utilization costs. And most doctors report it's hard to administer um, and improve profits. So part of your journey is to make the doctor's life better also, besides just getting paid for it. And then on the RPM and CCM, that's a little bit newer, but as of right now, about 1% of the doctors have billed for that set of billing codes. And again, they still seem to report that it's still administratively challenging. And now there's the added complexity of managing technology. And in the US, um, the, the, the doctors are, are sort of assuming their information technology group especially if I'm part of a big doctor group or a hospital, um, should manage this. But this is new enough that they're still figuring that out. And that's an opportunity for you. So, and then the doctors tend not to have a lot of technology skills on their own. Um, so, you know, the more you can make this easy, the more you can build in support. Those are all positives for them. And then the really great news is just in the last uh, two years, uh, additional billing codes. So we're up to about a dozen billing codes in this area of care management under CCM and RPM. But the under, you gotta understand there's only one billing code that's around $60 that is for the device technology. The rest are for nurses and uh, doctors and other providers to deliver the actual care remotely. 
So these are the billing codes for remote patient monitoring. Um, the ones that are not highlighted are for professional healthcare services around the device kits. And then 99454 is the billing code. It's the only one that exists right now that covers the technology. It's $69 per month and it's relatively new. Um, but as I mentioned, now we're up to 1% of the doctors have tried it. And as we talk to doctors, many would like to see it implemented and want great technology, again, that delivers better care than they can from just doing it at home. That's the opportunity for you. Um, I mentioned that chronic care is complex and I, I, find, I hope this is helpful. This is a lot of information and all these charts have a lot of information, but the whole idea is if you've got, uh, let's say, uh, depression, you think of that as a mental health issue, but the odds are you got a physical health issue um, by a rate of about 90%. So in other words, every time you get a chronic condition, the statistical odds are somewhere around 90%, 95% that you have another chronic condition. Uh, people with hypertension, 95% uh, of them have two or more chronic conditions. This is very complicated for doctors and patients to understand and manage multiple medications as well as lifestyle changes. And that's where digital health can shine. So I, I, I'm sharing this information, hopefully to give you ideas on how to target certain aspects of your technology and solution. But the top um, devices, you know, the highest sales are devices that have some either individual element or a couple of these components, blood glucose, blood pressure, weight, heart rate, uh, sometimes ECG, you know, the actual pattern of the signal for the heart, uh, blood oxygen, body temperature, uh, breath volume. These, these are devices that are uh, broadly available uh, with dozens of companies providing them right now. And my recommendation is, you know, you, if you want to be like everybody else, then, you, you know, follow that path. I'm sharing all of this information in the spirit of there's probably a way to differentiate your device and put software around it and deliver it better uh, so that you can have, you know, a more complete and compelling solution compared to your competitors. Um, there's other devices that are not included in the RPM uh, reimbursement right now that kind of sit on the side, if you will. Um, and again, this may or may not be relevant, but just to give you, you know, concepts to think about, is there's fitness devices, things like Fitbit uh, watches, Apple watches, Samsung watches, um, and they measure steps, sleep, and activity. There are mental health uh, apps. Uh, I think of them as digital health diary um, that help with measuring depression, anxiety, uh, cognition, activities of daily living. Um, not integrated into this world today, but, but potential to integrate is labs and lifestyle uh, type of data, uh, genetic and biome, your gut uh, uh, quality. Um, and then kind of what sits on the side is this uh, broad array of patient data that's captured in an electronic health record and, and captures the uh, patient's current care plan. Um, all of these are elements of this ecosystem to deliver great digital health. And again, where the money is right now um, and up to about $300, U.S. per patient per month is around patients with two or more chronic conditions. So the most promising applications, uh, you know, right now the by far the money is going into telehealth to do secure uh, HIPAA compliant uh, audio and video interaction with a patient. Uh, right behind that though is this wave to do remote patient monitoring. So this is a good time to find a path into this market. Uh, again, same uh, you know, attributes are the primary ones that are currently getting invested in. Um, lots of different players in this uh, market with lots of different uh, solution approaches. You got uh, hospital vendors like Siemens Health, Foracare, TIDOC, iHealth. Uh, these are companies that go back a ways doing devices that go into hospitals to measure these kinds of uh, health attributes. They're now creating versions for the telehealth uh, uh, telemedicine market. You've got some consumer 
device companies that are springing up and going into the space, uh, RPM software companies. Many, many of these are fairly new and small companies, but it, you know, it's, this is uh, many uh, hundreds of billions of dollars that are becoming available. Um, and you got the electronic health record companies, so about 40 that are reasonable size here in the US and active. Uh, Epic, Cerner, Allscripts, and Athena Health are the larger ones. Um, so they're all adding CCM and RPM modules. Uh, then you have uh, some companies you might have heard of recently, like Lavongo, that have basically taken what I've just shared and have come up with versions of a device. So like Lavongo has a, uh, their own diabetes blood glucose reader. They have with that a big data analytics to understand what's going on with the patient and make recommendations through an app and, and do reminders uh, through roughly you know, text and mobile app interaction. And then you can call on an 800 number, a digital health coach. They put all that together, list price about $70, uh, probably averaging around $35 uh, a month per uh, employee. And they're, they're not going through the insurance industry. They, they chose to go to the self-insured employers who have the same set of issues and they're just funding the insurance themselves. It still gets tracked similar to how uh, the other billing codes I mentioned earlier, but they're self-insured. So that's another opportunity for you. And then you got the wearable vendors I mentioned, and then there's a growing group of uh, internet of things and smartphone sensor vendors, uh, Carantis 360, LiveLight. Uh, LiveLight lets you collect a number of vital signs by looking at a screen. Uh, uh, it's, I think it's headquartered out of Israel. Um, so these are, there, there's a lot of different ways of looking at this and a lot of different competitors. And, and again, I'm hoping this helps you find your path that will help you and be successful. And then um, you've got the, the, the market segmentation decision of, am I gonna focus on uh, the practitioner and, and the insurance paid model? As I mentioned, there's an option to work with em employers, especially the self-insured employers and focus on employees and members uh, in that model. And just on average, I, I would tell you that that model is gonna have less revenue per person per month than the doctor insurance model, but it, but it still can be very uh, uh, lucrative and profitable. Um, and then there's some companies that actually choose to go to patients direct uh, and have patients fund this out of pocket. That's, that's a lower cost per patient per month model. But all of these are, are real viable segments. You just need to decide where you're gonna have the most differentiation. And then again, importantly, what I have seen over and over, the companies that are successful make the investment in clinically meaningful outcomes as well as utilization cost outcome studies that have high statistical confidence. So I can convince in, a, in my marketing communications and my target audience really quickly, I'm better than whatever the alternatives are. And that's what digital health is about, is transforming care, making it better, and then validating that it's better. So that's, that's the journey that we are all uh, supporting. And there's lots of money here. Um, you know, one uh, study from a few years ago by MarketWatch uh, provides these global numbers. Uh, a more recent study from uh, Statista uh, provides some additional numbers. Um, I basically did an estimate if I combine all of those that says right now the uh, telemedicine RPM market um, is around 27 to 35 billion a year right now. And um, you know, it's growing somewhere you know, between 20 and 30% a year right now. So it's very high growth, very huge opportunity. Um, the other thing that's going on is both patients and doctors uh, now with COVID and having some experience with telehealth, the, the video aspect of it. Um, big increase in terms of uh, patients' willingness or, or not even willingness, they want a virtual care uh, experience. So that's grown 28% uh, over the last couple of years. And then doctors uh, largely are not afraid of telehealth anymore. Uh, in the U.S., we're above roughly 70%. The older doctors, a little bit challenging, but I, I have found even they are open to it if I can show clinical outcomes that are better than what they're doing in the clinic uh, office setting only. And then and to some degree, that's reduced their income by not having 
patients come in, which is still a, a challenge even now. So that, that, that's a big opportunity. So, so the Samwell group studies this roughly annually, shares this information, a good resource if you wanna poke at the digital health uh, feedback from both doctors and patients. Um, on the investor side and kind of how to think about your segmentation and if you are raising money for your company, you know, this is kind of the, uh, you know, the way to think about where to characterize your playing and who your competitors are. Um, tens of billions of dollars are going into digital health companies right now a year. So lots of money is available. The reason there's that much money available is if you look at some of the last roughly 10 years uh, exits, uh, they're getting very high multiples of their annuity annual sales. So investors like annuity sales, and that's what the digital health market is setting up. It's a, it's a great opportunity for investors and you as a major innovator in the space. Um, I've been asked to kind of explain the difference between uh, the physician, the individual doctor versus the hospital or the integrated health system. Um, let me, let me just give you, because of this time is short, there, there's just key sort of segmentation things to think about. And each of them, you know, you could go spend hours talking about, but there, there's the concept of an integrated health system where all the doctors in the system for that grouping of patients, a, a larger health system might have millions of uh, patients, just to give you an idea, and thousands of doctors. They all share one system for information, electronic health records to support those patients. Then you got another model where we're connected to a hospital, but the hospital has one system, the doctor has another, and they, they do share information, but they're not fully integrated and they're not coordinating care. That's the main uh, difference. Um, what I believe digital health is gonna do is add one more layer of what it really means to be integrated, and that is to integrate social care and uh, I mentioned social determinants of health earlier. Th that, that's the phraseology of pulling mental health, social health, all into one integrated system. And the better integrated health systems are reasonably active in solving that right now. But, but that's an opportunity, I think, for digital health companies to add value there because they're struggling with how to do that efficiently. Um, then you've got the nonprofit uh, hospitals and, and physicians. Um, and then you've got the for-profit. Um, uh, the for-profit is actually you know, growing. Uh, there are companies here that are raising capital from you know, the equity market to help fund you know, best-in-class hospital systems, integrated health systems, or uh, accountable care organizations. So um, you gotta really understand what, what the pros and cons of those are for your type of solution. Um, you've got uh, hospital systems that are largely employee-based, those are more homogeneous, uh, easier to predict how they're going to behave. Uh, you have a chance of getting decisions made usually a little bit faster. Then you've got um, a number of systems uh, that are contractor-based. They, they just choose to have a small number of employees as a percent and everybody else is contracted so they can pick and choose what kind of uh, uh, doctors and how many uh, that they want at any given time. Uh, Fee-for-service versus value-based. In the U.S., the value-based ones are called accountable care organizations. And you just, again, got to decide, you know, where you want to play. Uh, Fee-for-service is still over 80% of the billing activity um, in, and probably over 90% for the CCM and RPM. Um, but the growing area is the accountable care or value-based and getting bonus based on results. And then you've got um, the highly aligned doctor groups where all the systems are really tied together well. Kaiser Permanente, Mayo Clinic are examples of that. And then you've got the splintered or silo doctor groups. They, they largely align around uh, oncology or ER and, and they share information, but they're really not coordinating the care, especially also with the, the primary care doctor. Um, and again, there's, depending on what you're doing, you, your value add may fit better in one of those segments or another. Um, there, there is, I think less than 10% is what I've seen of small independent doctors left. Uh, so, it's, so that on its own is declining, but what's kind of new 
is some of those folks are organizing around different models. That's how they're staying in business and funding the technology they need. Uh, there's an idea of a direct pay doctor. So I as, I, as a patient, pay a certain amount of, per month and I get my doctor, my primary care doctor's services. Uh, there's another version of that where they add a little bit broader insurance coverage. Uh, Teladoc is a good example of that. So just a lot of interesting uh, um, market segments and just know what you're trying to do and try and match up as best as you can with the best segments. One common ingredient that they and, and all of us follow here in the U.S. is uh, uh, HIPAA. It's our acronym for uh, the Patient Health Information Data Privacy and Security Regulations. Um, so underlying all of this is the idea of portable data that's secure that allows multiple doctors, nurses to work together to help a patient get better care. So let me share a little story about individual ethics. Um, we, we identified several years ago the, the trend that I'm sharing with you today. And we spotted that very few doctors have the resources, uh, IT resources, the financial know-how, the administrative know-how to organize what has been mostly an acute care, uh, maybe single chronic condition care model for the primary care physician to embrace all these new technologies and all these new at-home care models. And then we also found out 90% of them still aren't convinced that at-home care is gonna be better than clinical care. I still wanna see the patient physically and the real value of making uh, digital health and, and telemedicine work is I, as the doctor, start feeling like I can give better care uh, by getting and talking to them remotely. So th that's the journey that we signed up to help uh, provide. Um, we decided we were not gonna get in the device business. We we're gonna partner with the best in class device leaders, whether they're the number one guy like Fitbit or they're brand new like Carantis 360 out of the UK that does an in-home IoT monitoring system. We've integrated both, but we're not trying to integrate everybody. We're trying to integrate a best in class solution that doctors and patients and insurers find deliver the greatest value. And then what we are doing is trying to make it so the professional services people the nurses, the psychiatrists, the psychologists, the exercise physiologists, uh, pharmacists could all team together and deliver great care in coordination with the primary care doctor. So that's what we've set up to do. And that's largely how we have learned a lot of the information I'm sharing with you. The problem we are solving, not anybody else, but what we spotted is there's a lack of a comprehensive system to get high accuracy information to the provider to know whether a particular treatment is working or not working for that one patient. That's called individual science. So this comes from many other uh, doctors and specialists that have spotted when you have multiple conditions and multiple interve interventions, treatments, uh, even lifestyle changes, how do I get more accuracy to know what's working and not working and optimizing that for each patient? And then uh, one of our board uh, advisory board members is a gentleman named Dr. Gordon Guyette. He is the person that um, for some 30 years has been writing the um, manual for doctors to learn how to apply evidence-based medicine you know, across all these different diseases. And he's gone uh, on record since 1986 doing research and supporting. If you're gonna treat a patient, a single patient well, you need to integrate N of one, uh, you know, uh, N of one is a, imagine a clinical trial with one person. You have to evaluate that one person at a time. And that's what we have created as a patent pending solution that brings in multiple device data against multiple conditions, gives the doctor a dashboard to see what's working, not working very efficiently, matter of minutes, and then recommend an improved course of action that doesn't include just meds now. Now it can include, let me help you take a few extra steps a day or maybe sleep a little bit better or, as examples. So our solution is uh, meant to be very accurate, convenient, uh, always help the patients protect their health and get better, uh, eliminate the side effect issues. Um, and it's all fully integrated, including rolls up the data into the EHR system that the doctor uh, uses. And most importantly, not treat every patient as an average patient because they don't really exist. We're both 
the same, but we're also all unique. And we're bringing those two sciences together with more sensor devices. So we're, we're using that same $60 RPM code, but we're putting uh, a lot more technology under the covers. And uh, we figured out how to do that through some financing mechanisms and some other delivery model approaches to optimize this under the current billing codes. And then as we provide evidence of great outcomes, our intention is to help the insurance industry fund this even better. But basically, if you can imagine at the intersection of the doctor and the patient, there's also family members and a multidisciplinary care team, and they all need to be working off of the same information, higher quality. Uh, think of, you know, Six Sigma quality. That, that's our kind of delivery model. And our patients love it. it is, they all want to get better. It just turns out it's hard. And I got into this because my dad was one of these patients and I saw firsthand how all these different uh, specialists and doctor uh, primary care folks really couldn't get on the same page of what meds were working and not working. So, so here's, here's a, our, my summary of how to think about uh, the market. It's a little bit biased based on our point of view of delivering precision, personalized, optimized care for each patient one at a time. But it gives you an idea, hopefully, of where you might find opportunities to add value is under the red column is the results after many decades of delivering population health only evidence-based care. And it's getting enhanced now with software companies and device companies coming into CCM and RPM, mainly with a population health delivery model. And that's what all the doctors understand. So that's a good place to enter the US market because you got to fit their clinical workflows, you got to fit how they were trained. Then you got the newcomers that said, I'm going to kind of go a little around that. I'm not going to work with the doctor. I'm going to target a specific disease. And Livongo, Valentis, Verda, Omada, they, they have a number of diseases. One of the most common is diabetes. And they're getting really good at measuring uh, your blood glucose level very precisely, getting that data fed back, applying big data analytics to optimize you know, your diet, maybe your insulin level like Valentis, um, another one out there called Hygieia you might want to look at. But they're doing a really good job of helping you really um, organize your daily blood glucose level to have a healthy, high quality life. But when you look at them, they only work for one disease. As soon as you want to integrate two or three or four, they don't tie that together. And they're roughly given around um, six to 10% increase over traditional, you know, medication alone models. So that's six to 10% is really good. It's in the category of almost like a drug itself. So, um, but the opportunity that, again, I mentioned earlier, the market is around multiple chronic conditions. If you don't have two or more conditions, those billing codes that I mentioned uh, don't apply. So in the US, you have to have the doctor record two diagnosis codes, and then you can apply for CCM and RPM, and it flows easily across all the major insurers. So that's what we have focused on under Individualytics, and that's how I've learned all this information I just shared with you. Uh, our, we have a very talented team who's gathered all this. And our goal is to deliver even better outcomes by optimizing all the different conditions and treatments and letting the doctor and patient know that more quickly. And, and we validated that that revenue opportunity, you know, $42 for basic CCM, around $150 for CCM and RPM. This is how the doctor sees the money. Just, um, you know, the, the portion that goes to the device only is around the $60 level. And then now the doctors can make anywhere from $200 to $350 per patient per month. That's, that's, the, that's brand new revenue to most of these doctors. So, so you can bring new revenue to the doctors. And uh, just a few more quick tidbits. Uh, prior to COVID in the US, this is a MIT data, was, they were doing 3,000 virtual visits per week according to Medicare or Medicaid, the federal program. With COVID, it went to 1.7 million per week. <laughs> a little bit of growth. Um, and so there's this, there's this new idea of, of kind of a digital health delivery you know, framework that's coming around and you wanna figure out how to plug into that. And I'm hoping this presentation has given you enough insights around all the different 
sort of perspectives to think about. Um, but, you know, care at home has to be better than the doctor seeing me face to face. That should be your goal. Uh, reimbursements, I believe, will grow. The evidence of that is there's been continuous growth for the last five years. There's actually a bill pending in Congress right now to eliminate the copay and coinsurance for care management. Um, right now, RPM is focused on single variables. I, I think the next wave will be dealing with two and three and four variables. Uh, I've, I've recently seen a couple FDA uh, approvals for devices like that. Um, right now, there's only one uh, $60 billing code per patient per month. That's the 99454. I expect that to either grow in value or there'll be new technology sort of uh, uh, differentiated billing uh, code opportunities. Um, and then I, I, I keep mentioning the self-insured employers. They're, they're their own little market, but, um, but it's sizable. Um, so, and then just be really clear in your value proposition, which diseases you're great at serving and developing the evidence that, that you're good at that. And largely all you gotta do is find one or two doctors uh, in the US willing to work with you and that patient community to help get to that validation. It's, it's not actually that big of a task, but, but you gotta find the right one or two doctors. Um, and then I, I think from a patient view and to some degree the doctor, convenience, ease of use, uh, you know, perceived as the best value and outcomes, uh, reducing administrative burden. Those are all things that um, I, I find both the doctors and the patients um, are looking for. It, you know, so I think of it as like the consumer oriented digital healthcare model, e even though that's not what the insurance industry is paying for. Uh, what we're finding is that what's, that's what creates higher adoption for your solution. So I really appreciate uh, you know, the time together. Uh, I am open to accepting questions uh, through uh, Career Bio, uh, or you can email me directly. Uh, again, uh, have a great day and thank you for your time. Good morning, Korea Bio. Very happy to be here to um, share some information with you and I look forward to your Q&A uh, later after the presentation. Um, we're gonna to talk today about how investors think and what they need to hear if you're trying to raise money from them. Um, a little bit about my background on this slide here and contact information. Uh, I've been uh, an angel investor for a period of time. I started the very first group in, in the Michigan in 2002. So I've been looking at deals uh, like you would be presenting for a very long time. Um, I've invested in some deals and I've been a CEO raising money for another startup as well. So I've been in your shoes. Here's my contact information. Uh, look forward to getting started on the presentation. Okay. So a little bit about Cityside uh, Ventures. We are a group here in Birmingham, Michigan, outside Detroit that um, are helping raise money at the angel level. Um, we're not doing venture deals, we're doing early stage angel deals where the companies oftentimes, uh, oftentimes do not have um, their first customer yet and no revenue. They're working on a proof of concept. But we like that because we feel the companies can use our help and uh, we can help uh, save them a lot of time and effort by um, sharing our experience with them so they can grow faster and need less revenue uh, to raise for themselves or capital rather. Um, so we have Birmingham Angels. We'll soon have a Great Lakes Angels Fund that also put money, $10 million fund into early stage companies anywhere in, in the world. They don't have to be in Michigan. And uh, as Ken knows, I've traveled to Korea before. I love the technology coming out of Korea. It's some great stuff. We look forward to seeing it. So we'll start with how do investors think and what do you need to hear they need to hear to um, fund your startup. First thing is, as I point out here, they're very busy. And so if you want to get their attention, you have to quickly describe what your deal is all about. Be very succinct, um, be clear, don't fumble in explaining the deal. Practice your, your one minute, two minute pitch that you might do in an elevator, so to speak, with your family or friends that know nothing about what you're doing and see if they get it. If they don't get it, your message isn't working. You gotta explain it very simply. 
and you need to make it compelling. This is a very exciting because this solves the following problem. We want to know what is it you're trying to deal with. A lot of people are start the startup companies are technology people. And they get enamored and explain the technology. We don't care about the technology to get our attention. We want to know what's the problem you're solving. How big is that problem before I want to understand your solution? If you're not addressing a problem that I recognize or the end user is not going to recognize, you're solving something that it doesn't go anywhere because you can't sell anything to anybody if they don't appreciate that there's an issue that you're trying to solve for them. So we want to know as investors how significant is the problem and is the pain for the problem felt by the market or do you have to educate on what the pain is? If to educate them, then that's going to take a lot more capital to make it happen. So we really want you to focus on um, getting um, message across with um, what the problem is at a very high level. Don't get too deep into the, in the weeds, so to speak. Don't get too much into detail. Give us a high level issue what the pain is. Is it um, because of patient care? Is it because of physicians um, not having the right kind of tools and that kind of whatever it is? Uh, what is the pain? Who's it felt by? And then um, we wanted to know why has the problem been solved? If it's a problem, then they've been dealing with this problem. So what are they doing to get around the problem right now? Um, is there a solution that's really very crude that's uh, addressing the problem? And that's why you have an opportunity to solve the problem. So we really understand, need to understand what is it you're solving. If you don't get past that, then we have no need to listen to you. We really want to know what it is and make sure you get our attention quickly. Don't fumble, like I said. So next is what is your solution and why is it better? Keep it simple. A lot of people in technology companies use a lot of technical, ter technical terms and abbreviations that the, the investor may not be familiar with. So use words that they can understand. We always tell people to dummy it down. <laughs> Investors aren't dummies, but they don't understand the techno lingo all the time. So you need to speak in, in common language that they'll understand. And how are the potential problems that a customer is solving this problem right now? They've got to be doing something. Like if it's a surgical procedure, you've got a new way to uh, do a new implant. Well, they're solving it now. We want to understand where are they going to be coming to make a change from? Is the change you're asking them to make going to be something that's going to be uh, too hard to understand and change the way they, they normally operate. If it's a big change in the way they operate, the software, the solution, the hardware, uh, the meds, wherever it is, you're going to have resistance. People are normally resistant to change. So you need to make sure what you have is easy for them to upgrade what they're doing and adopt it. Um, and what other companies are addressing this problem? There's got to be somebody doing something to get things done right now. You might say, well, nobody else can do what we do. Okay, maybe that's so. But somebody else is dealing with that same problem that you're trying to address and maybe in a completely different way, but it's out there in the marketplace and that's your competition. So we want you to understand and convey to us how are other people's competing in this space. And the best way to do that is really do a matrix. If you have a chance to see somebody, don't just grab well, we do this better than they do this. Words are not the same as a graphic. We're visual. Help us understand it with a nice chart. Here's our benefits, and here's what we do, and here's what they don't do, and what they do do. So we see where the weaknesses and strengths are, and why you're there. Is the pricing important? You don't have to be the, the uh, lowest priced customers to win a business. I was with J&J with &J for a number of years. We were often the highest priced product in the marketplace, but yet we still dominated our markets because we brought more, more value to the customer with education, with service, with quality of the product. Those kind of things are important to the user, not just the price. So don't leave money on the table with your solution. Price it right in the marketplace. And if you price it too low, you know, look like the quality is not there. It's perception here as well. So think about what your solution is, why it's better. We want to know also how strong is the management team? Um, do you have full-time employees? We're not going to put money into a company that has nobody full-time in the company. So if it goes belly up, what have you lost? Our money. You haven't lost your job. 
or more sweat equity that you put into the company over a couple of years. We want to know, are there full-time employees? What are their roles? Who's doing the fundraising? Do they have experience on that? Most of the time, it should be a CEO, not some business person in the company, but the CEO. We want to see who the face of the company is. And do you have R&D? That's normally how everybody starts. Are you getting the right kind of uh, tax credits for R&D? Are you applying for that? You're doing the best you can to take loans and leases on equipment, you know, rather than paying outright with them for cash. We want to make sure you understand how to use your money. Who's going to do the marketing? Um, it's very important that um, a lot of companies fail with a great product, but they don't execute. They don't know how to take the product or the concept to the marketplace very well. They think, oh, it's going to sell itself. Well, this is a really great solution. When we get out there, people are going to buy it. No, it takes work. You need a sales team, you need marketing. They're very different from each other. And you have to make sure you've got good margins to sustain yourself. So we need to understand there's people in the management team that understand those disciplines and differences to make it happen. Do you have relevant industry background and a track record? Maybe you, you came from a sales experience on the team and they're completely different marketplace, but you're a hell of a salesperson. Well, if you don't know who the customer base you're going to be talking to with this product line here and you're the VP of sales, that's a red flag. We need to know if somebody understands the market, how this is going to get in the marketplace, who's going to talk to them, and what your distribution channels that you thought about are. Because like I say, a lot of them break down on the execution. That's going to market. So the management team is very, very important on that. And oftentimes, the founders of the company just have themselves. They don't bring in seasoned outside business advisors. You don't have to pay these people full time. They could be advisors on the business side, the technology side, on the fundraising side, a banker, whatever. Um, I wouldn't put lawyers on your advisory team because they're going to caution you from doing anything. <laughs> put business people in there that can help you with opening doors for, for sales, opening doors for uh, getting additional capital, and business advice and technical advice. So we like to see companies that have business advisors around them, surrounding the management team. Because normally that's a weak point. And as you start with maybe two or three people, but you can have three or four advisors that really strengthen your ability, especially if they have good relevant contact, uh, contact information. Pathway to payment. Well, we're in the medical field, we're talking about that. So everything has to be paid for. What will the market bear for your product or service? Let's say somebody else in the marketplace is selling it. Um, uh, $100 for what you have in mind, uh, and that's your competition price point. Well, you need to understand you probably can't come in and charge $300 for something unless you can show there's substantial uh, value in that, that it saves time, saves money that can be measured. That we think it will do that, it can, needs to be measured. You can, you can charge more price than the competition if you can bring the real value there. Um, but you want to be in the ballpark, okay? I know I, I launched a product uh, with j, j one time that was 10 times higher than the other product. It was a medical device. But I got champions in two major hospitals in the United States to publish on the device to show how it was a great teaching tool beyond just being a surgical tool. And it, it eliminated having extra people in the OR do the procedures with and stuff like that. So it was a big savings for the for the uh, marketplace, even though it was 10 times higher than what we've been selling before in competition. So really look for where the, where the real value is, where you're saving on that. Um, and you don't have to be less expensive, I said before. You'd be, you can be same price or higher, but you really have to sell more about what you're bringing, the way of value, whether it's quality, um, expertise, service, um, training. Um, your salespeople have to be very, very strong. And, um, if you have good client relationships with people, um, that makes a lot of difference to get in the door and make your product be acceptable. Does it require some kind of coded reimbursement? Uh, in the United States, a lot of reimbursement was Medicare or the private carriers and stuff like that. You need to find out what the path is to get those if they're not there. And if they are there, but you don't know what they are, you might need an expert to help you find out what the reimbursement codes are to match up to your product or service, drug, whatever it is. Um, so you need to know where to get some help in the U.S. I'm talking to Ken about maybe find some folks that can help with that kind of stuff. Uh, you just had somebody present recently talking about digital 
health and reimbursement for that. Um, what is your execution plan and who will do it? We want to understand what are you going to do to go to the market? You're in R&D right now. You're raising money for that. You need a half million or million dollars to get through R&D. And then what? Do you have a laid out plan? Do you have a map? Do you have timetables? Do you have costs? Um, do you have a breakdown on what those are for the next 12 months and 24 months, month by month? So we know you've got detail and understand where your money's going, where the manpower is, what events you're happening to do, what how much cost of further clinical trials are, travel, everything else like that. We want you to know that you have the information. If we can trust that you have it, gives us more confidence in your ability to succeed. Do you have clinical sites and clinicians in the US can help test your product? I know when I did clinical trials around the world for launches on a global basis, I found uh, clinic clinicians uh, based here from Michigan in Scandinavia, in Germany, uh, in Korea, in Japan, and other places to help test my product and publish on it in those marketplaces, which made a, an open door when I wanted to go in those marketplaces with product. I now had local nationals who are publishing on the product to get up with speed the adoption. So you want to be in this marketplace, you need to find clinical people that can help you market test your product here and publish on it. You want to find people that are luminaries in this space, which is not easy to find, but they're there and help them then and, and you have to really convince them to uh, test your product and then uh, help publish on it. Make sure the publishing is tied to the testing. That'll really help it out. And then understand your pathway for, for uh, getting uh, FDA approval. I'm sure you all know what the Novo is and 510Ks. Um, so I'm not gonna um, go into that in a lot of detail, but either one is acceptable to the marketplace here. Um, and whatever you can do to put more barriers to entry up uh, for entry for the competition, the better for you. But uh, you need to understand the cost and the timing when this is going to happen. Some people think that as soon as you have the 510K ready or your de novo process ready, you're ready to go to market. But if you haven't laid out the marketing plan, have clinical trials published and stuff like that, you get out there and say, okay, well, who's publishing on this? Well, we haven't done publishing yet. Well, then don't start selling until you got some kind of um, legitimacy achieved, like some publishing on it. So that's where the cost and timing comes into this. Your execution plan has to show the sequence of what needs to be done. Do the R&D, you get it, start the publishing on it while you're getting ready to file for, the, for your regulatory approval. So when the regulatory approval comes, you hopefully have your publishing ready to go. Now you're armed to go out and, and generate sales. And whoever your distribution channel is, has got that lined up for them already. Otherwise, you're, they're held back and you can't sell anything really until somebody's a very high risk taker and will buy it without having it published. That's not very likely in most marketplaces. And who would do the sales and market in the U.S.? When you're testing for a distribution channel in the U.S., um, I expect you're going to have a Korean national here to oversee that somehow and then use local folks to do it, whether it's direct sales or distributor sales or specialist distributors that can sell these kind of products. But you really do need to do a shake down understanding them and understand what competing lines are they selling and how much of their gross sales would you contribute to make it worth for them to pick up your product line. If you have something that's really compelling, you can sell thousands of dollars uh, per salesman per month type of thing, you can get their attention. But if you're going to sell something that's maybe $1,000 every month, um, you're going to be low on the totem pole for them spending their time promoting it. So you need to find your distributors that are hungry for new products. And fortunately, distributors see companies come and go, use them as a way to get the marketplace and abandon them once the product gets uh, accepted. So there are people out there, but really need to understand them. You need to make sure you understand how to set distribution agreements, performance clauses. So if they don't perform, you don't wait a year to find out they're not going to perform. I always did distribution agreements with a, a schedule of what they're going to do in the first three months, six months, and 12 months. And if they don't meet those early milestones, I pulled the carpet out. They didn't go any further. I wasted my time and energy with them. I need to be in the market. So you need to understand who's going to do that. That's where your execute, execution plan, you're getting the market is very, very important. That's what I said, a lot of companies fail in this area.
barriers to entry, IP, intellectual property. Forget patents. Have you started with what we call a non-disclosure agreement with all your employees and vendors so you keep any trade secrets internal from the get-go and document it and save them and make sure everybody signs one um, because you don't want to find out later you give you gave some vendor proprietary information to build something for you and you didn't protect it for non-compete even with vendors so that they if you start falling on this thing here and you don't you don't build the kind of volume they're expected to be a vendor they go well I know another company could use this. We can make it for them. Well, you can't let that happen. You got to have the right proper non-disclosure and, and non-competes with their different people. And you have to keep them consistent. Don't change it. Now, don't expect um, investors to sign an NDA to look at your deal. They're not going to do that. They see too many deals to do that. If they do that, they're naive investors. Don't expect them to do that. It's insult to ask an investor to look at that. Whatever you're presenting to them in a way of a PowerPoint or executive summary, stuff like, like that should not have confidential information in it. Withhold that until you get serious about something. But you can talk a lot of things in a general sense and make it attractive. Now, are your patents issued in the United States? Okay, but are, who, are they owned by the company? Are you uh, owned by the individual that's licensed to the company? That's not good. You need to have the patents owned by the company. And it's okay to be licensing in patents and stuff like that because you need the technology that way. But they need to be licensed to the company and you need exclusive rights to the company, to that technology for a pro prolonged period of time. And if there's performance clauses on that, you need to know what they are and investors do too. Because again, if you don't perform against some licensing opportunity, they can pull the carpet from you on that and you lose the opportunity for something you're, you're building a market for. Uh, so understand that that's part of the terms I'm talking about here. Also, if you're using an IP firm in the States here, you've got somebody that can help you collaborate with your IP attorneys back here in Korea to make sure that you're getting the right kind of attorney. They're obviously, you're not going to abandon your people there, but they probably have counterparts in the States they can direct you to. If, if not, then we can help you find that. But it's important you have uh, IP uh, counsel on both, both continents. <coughs> And the investors want to know, how do I make money? And what is your exit strategy? Um, we're in this for the, when we make the investment, just like a VC, we're looking for when do we get out? We're not long time investors. We're not bankers looking to make money over time with you. We're looking to make an exit. So we want to know what is your initial raise? If it's too high, we won't even touch it. Angels won't touch the deal, $10 million rounds even most times $5 million rounds. If you can make it two or under and stage it, so the next round is maybe three or four the next time, you have a better chance of raising angel money. So you need to make it approachable so you can do it because nobody wants to come in and Andrew and put 250 or 500K into a round and know that's gonna have another $3 million to go yet. They go, oh geez, who's gonna put in the rest of the money? And I'm gonna be stuck here with maybe the only investor in the deal and it falls apart because they run out of cash. We don't want to think that way. We want to think that it's a round that we can help syndicate and get the deal done. Okay, so don't make the nut too big to go at the beginning or you won't get the money. Um, so in here I say it's less than two million five will be ready. And hopefully you have somebody pledged on this already. You're raising two million five, you got 500K already committed. Okay, it gives a little confidence somebody else in the deal. We also want you to know what quarter you think you'd be at break even. It might be three years out, maybe four years out, hopefully it's less than that, but you need to know what quarter you run your financials out. And on this quarter, third quarter of 2023, we expect to be a cash flow positive. Okay, that's break even. And then that means you don't have to keep running and raising equity rounds anymore, unless there's a real good reason that you wanna really scale up now, you need to raise it, but your valuation is much higher at that point. So the initial investors, uh, I've got a better position when you go and raise more money. Um, so we want to know what quarter you're going to raise the money and then the money you need to raise to get there um, is how much more than what your initial raise is. We want to know what the dilution impact is. If you're raising, let's say, $2 million now, we agree we want to take a piece of that. We want to know if it's the next round, 
two years out, is it going to be 9 million, 10 million? What's going to be in? Is that the last round? You're going to do another one later for 20 million? Because all that has impact on, on how much our percent ownership shrinks. But as long as the, as the pizza, as they say, keeps growing bigger, the pie, even though our percent shrinks, the value might grow. So we really need to understand what your total revenue needs are at the, until you think you're going to get to an exit. That's kind of what we're getting for. And you should know that yourself. You're raising the money. Um, so we want to see margin improvement in profits with volume as this thing scales out. The second year, the volume's going to, volume's going to increase. Margins are dropped. Third year, same thing again. Margins drop. Um, we want to know, again, how many years before we could see an exit. It might be five six, seven years out, but well, we'd like to know that. Now, we also know the first two years after the first year, it's pretty much fiction for real estimates of what's going on. It's a guesstimate the first year, but a very, very sound guesstimate. Okay, we understand that. Three years out is um, it's fiction, but you need to put planning into it to show how you think. We want to know that you're thinking this in detail. Turn off my timer here. Um, one second. Uh, okay. okay, sorry. <laughs> Let's just cover this thing up. Um, I mean, it works. So, how many years before we get to the accident? And at what time uh, is that? Is it five years out? I guess I'll turn this off anyway. And what are the typical multiples? Show us an example that you've done some comps that. Um, that's right. Sorry, that you've looked at other people in your space um, when they got to. Um, um, $200 million in sales, it was six times revenue for the exit. You know, you need to understand what your comps are in your industry so we can kind of appreciate when you get to certain, it doesn't have to be that number, just pick the number, but when you get to that, we'd like to understand what the multiples are and are there real examples of the kind of company that you think that would be your exit strategy, making acquisitions in your space. I've had some people um, bring great, thanks to us, but they say our exit is going to be with company X or X. And we do some research, find out those companies never made acquisitions. <laughs> so you might be in their face with your what you're doing, but they have no history of making acquisitions, then that's not really an exit. And we're not going to wait for an IPO. So find people that could really be an exit. And most of our exits we like are strategic acquisitions or another type of acquisition. And that's how we cash out. That's what we want to know. We're going to have to make money like you are. So um, I think I ran out of time with Bell on that there, but uh, I look forward to your questions at a later date and answering them at that time. Anything else, Ken? I'm Yun Hazeo, and hello, everyone. My name is Kurt Imhoff. I am the Vice President for Policy and Public Affairs at Life Sciences Pennsylvania. Uh, in today's presentation, I'm going to give everyone uh, an overview of what the ecosystem for the life sciences uh, looks like in Pennsylvania, uh, and then broader, you know, what some of the trends are uh, nationally as well. Uh, and I'm going to have a particular focus on some of the trends we've seen in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia uh, in particular uh, in the cell and gene therapy sector, a, a growing sector of, uh, of the life sciences. So before I get into some of the information on, on how the life sciences are growing nationally and, and in Pennsylvania, I do just want to give a, a quick um, overview on, on who Life Sciences Pennsylvania is. So we are a statewide trade association for the Commonwealth's life sciences community. Uh, we are an independent not-for-profit organization. <clears throat> Excuse me, we have about 830 member organizations those members are comprised of large pharmaceutical manufacturers, small biotech companies, device and diagnostics companies, academic research institutions, uh, patient advocacy groups, uh, 
investment firms with R&D based portfolios and all of the service providers that really prop up that industry. So law firms, accounting firms, uh, real estate entities, uh, clinical research organizations, contract manufacturers, all you know, the industry around the industry that is uh, that really helps prop up all of the work of our, our R&D member companies, our research and development based member companies. Uh, as you can see here, we are, uh, our mission is to ensure Pennsylvania is a global leader in the life sciences by creating a business and publicly public policy environment which fosters life sciences growth and success. We really do that in two ways. That's by public policy advocacy. So working with uh, state and federal legislators on, on policies that incentivize growth in the life sciences and uh, facilitating strategic connections, holding programs, educational events, and, uh, and networking events throughout the year that help our members connect with one another and grow. Uh, the other thing I'll also point out here is that we are a partner with five national trade associations, uh, some of which you may or may be familiar. Uh, ACRO is the Association for Clinical Research Organizations. Uh, AdvaMed and MDMA are both focused on the medical device and diagnostic uh, uh, industries. And then bio and pharma are obviously both biopharmaceutical related trade associations. So we, we partner with them on events throughout the year in our, our advocacy work, both in, in, in Washington, DC and in Pennsylvania's capital, Harrisburg. Uh, but we, we work very closely with those, with those national partners. Uh, just to give you a, a quick understanding of, of what the life sciences really looks like in, in Pennsylvania, or at least for our membership, it's really focused on uh, companies that are working to improve human health. Some of our national association partners and others will include things like uh, biofuels, industrial biotech and ag in there. That's not something that we focus on, but it is, is sometimes gets looped in or, or lumped in, I should say, with that, that, that uh, bio category. Um, at the national level, um, actually this, this information is, is came out last June um, from one of our national partners, Bio, uh, and also from a, a, a report we had commissioned by a KPMG just a few years ago. But the national biosciences industry uh, employs about 1.87 million workers uh, across more than 101,000 uh, U.S. business establishments. That's as of, <clears throat> as of 2018. Uh, and obviously a significant economic impact comes along with that. So $2.6 trillion. Um, there's a, a number of, of smaller biocidical firms that play a key role in innovation uh, and, and really account for 60% or more of all FDA drug approvals over the past three years. So I, I think it's really important to note here that while a lot of, of, of our members and you know, the folks we work with <clears throat> are familiar with the big names in, in pharmaceutical manufacturing, GlaxoSmithKline, Merck, Bayer, all of those uh, large entities, you know, multinational corporations, um, but it's really, you know, it really is a startup community. Uh, and I know just in our membership alone of our approximately 450 research and de development focused organizations, about 72% of those are companies of 10 employees or fewer. So a very startup entre entrepreneurial community that exists here in, in Pennsylvania and nationally. Um, apart from uh, apart from the, the national numbers, or I should say diving into the national numbers a little bit more, uh, what you'll also see here are significant growth trends. Um, this, this chart just compares the, the total private sector versus the biosciences industry. Obviously, you'll see here that the, the biosciences industry in general far outpaces uh, where private industry stands. That, I, that obviously speaks to some of the, um, the things you'll see later on in the presentation, but I, I think is, is indicative of the resiliency of our companies, especially over the course of the past year, 20, uh, in 2020, amid a pandemic, obviously many of our member companies were working on diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics related to COVID-19. Um, so thankfully, uh, we've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of our companies uh, continue to succeed and even grow in a, in a time frame where there were clearly a lot of businesses that were, that were uh, having, facing some very difficult decisions. Uh, just, just furthering up on this, um, right under uh, software computer services, biosciences does not lag far behind in, uh, in employment trends. Um, I will also note, and this is something that um, I don't have on this graph, but maybe, maybe should have put in here, 
is that when you look at R&D expenditures uh, year over year, uh, a lot of times the pharmaceutical industry spends about, I think it's about 20, 25% of its profits on research and development or puts it, its revenues, I should say, back into research and development. So a significant amount of uh, the funding of our member companies or the revenue of our member companies goes directly back, back into researching and developing new therapies, cures, technologies, et cetera. Um, and that, that, that often leads the category in terms of industry uh, investment in research and development. So, uh, you know, a very, very heavy, uh, heavy resource area of investment. Uh, and obviously for, for good reason, it's a very risky endeavor. There are a lot of companies that ultimately fail, unfortunately, um, and it's not because of uh, necessarily any, any decision by the FDA or issues there. It's really just a fact of, of, of science. You know, the human body is still very complicated. There's still a lot of things to learn. And unfortunately, about nine out of every 10 new drug applications with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration ultimately fail. So companies have to be prepared for that, that loss. Um, uh, outside of that, uh, again, just furthering on, on some of the employment growth in the life sciences, this breaks down uh, the, the growth a little bit more into subsectors. So looking at um, uh, biosciences industry, bio-related distribution, medical devices and equipment, uh, research, testing and medical labs, et cetera, um, still uh, all very strong growth indicators for uh, different facets of the life sciences. <clears throat> Excuse me. Building off of that, um, here's a little bit more information about uh, biosciences establishments and employment uh, in the U.S. Again, this just gives you a little bit more of an indication of how things continue to grow uh, and how changes look uh, year over year in, in, uh, in the life sciences. So all, um, all helpful numbers, but again, I think you know, reiterating the similar point in a lot of ways. Um, now more specific to Pennsylvania, uh, one of the things you'll see here is that uh, uh, a map of the Commonwealth um, and, um, and, and you'll see a kind of a, a heat map of where our clusters are, uh, where, where we have a lot of our member companies located. So um, while we have about 830 members in our organization, there are over 2,800 life sciences establishments total in the Commonwealth. And it, to my earlier point about small companies, 52% of those uh, 2,800 com uh, companies are are, are those with 10 employees or fewer. So again, very startup entrepreneurial focused community. Uh, the life sciences clusters are, are noted here, but obviously there's really strong clusters around Philadelphia. Uh, Pittsburgh in particular has a really strong medical device presence. Uh, so medical devices, diagnostics, med tech, med tech generally are very heavy in Southwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, but then we see other small pockets as well near uh, near Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton in, in what we call the Lehigh Valley, and then in central Pennsylvania around Harrisburg, Hershey, uh, and in that space. So not surprisingly, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these clusters are focused around places with well-established economies, uh, large academic research institutions, and other large pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, legacies. Uh, specific to Pennsylvania, we have about uh, 112,000 in direct employment uh, from the life sciences in Pennsylvania. So a significant number of employees directly tied to the life sciences. Um, again, obviously very strong uh, annual wages. Um, one of the things that really sets us apart from other places in the country is the, the National Institutes of Health funding our academic research institutions receive. So it's in the neighborhood of $1.9 billion, um, billion. I think if you look at the most recent numbers that I just saw, uh, that number is eclipsed $2 billion. And uh, candidly, a lot of that is going to two institutions in particular, the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Pittsburgh, which are two of the top 10 uh, NIH grant recipients in the country. Uh, those, that funding uh, and the science that that, that funding um, uh, really uh, initiates does two things. It obviously advances basic science, but it also trains a workforce that is, it can either stay in the, the research setting or the the, uh, the, the academic research setting or, you know, propel them on to uh, work at, at one of our smaller companies or uh, a large pharma, pharma uh, manufacturer as well. So that NIH funding is really critical to the, the life sciences ecosystem, this ecosystem that exists here. Uh, the other thing I think it's really important to note here is the 
uh, close to 3.5 billion in venture capital investments over the past several years. Um, all of these numbers combine, combine generally put Pennsylvania in about the, the fifth or sixth uh, uh, top life sciences clusters in the country. I should say Philadelphia in particular, uh, but Pennsylvania more broadly really fall into that uh, top 10 in life sciences clusters in the country. So all very, very helpful. Uh, a little bit more, <clears throat> excuse me, of a breakdown of those numbers. I'm not gonna go through all of these numbers for everyone, you can obviously read through this chart, but very helpful information to look through uh, if you're interested in diving a little bit deeper into what the uh, the makeup of the life sciences industry and the subsectors are, uh, economically speaking, in the, the Commonwealth. Again, uh, very similar information, just uh, looking at a couple different subsectors as well. So where do we see growth happening in the Commonwealth and in particular in the, the life sciences um, uh, in the Commonwealth? And, and I think, you know, you can, you can expand these a little more broadly to the, to the, the national setting as well. Um, so, you know, I, I'd be remiss if, if I didn't mention COVID-19. Um, you know, over the course of the past year, many of our member companies have pivoted to work on uh, vaccines, diagnostics, uh, therapeutics, uh, to treat patients with COVID-19. So, it, you know, it, it's been a, you know, an incredibly uh, uplifting uh, effort by our, our, our member companies who are working tirelessly to develop these things. Obviously, we've seen incredible turnaround with, uh, with vaccines in particular. Um, the mRNA vaccine, uh, the base that Pfizer and Moderna both, Moderna both use was uh, was created at the, uh, the University of Pennsylvania. So a very important uh, legacy there. Um, but obviously our, our companies have, have been engaged in, in more than just the vaccine effort from testing to, to therapeutics to other things. So <clears throat> moving on to uh, uh, where we really see long-term growth in the, the Commonwealth and really amongst our small member companies is in the cell and gene therapy sector. So these are biologic treatments that can be injected to replace or repair damaged tissues or cell. Um, Philadelphia has really become a rising hub in this space. Uh, the, as you can see here, the, um, the, the region has gotten this Silicon Valley moniker. Uh, some people love it, some people hate it, but I think at the very least it draws attention to the, the leadership of, of Pennsylvania and Philadelphia uh, in particular in this, uh, this cell and gene therapy. Uh, a space. Um, obviously, you can see here from <clears throat> the last bullet that it's led to an investment of about four to five billion uh, in cell and gene therapy development and manufacturing. So it's meant a significant amount economically uh, to the region as well. Um, just following up on that, uh, there's been a couple of stories recently about investment in the life sciences in Pennsylvania. And again, I have a couple of examples of what that looks like in 2020, but actually just earlier this week, there was a, a story about what 2021 first quarter investment looked like in, in Pennsylvania. And there was about 2.9, yeah, 2.9 billion in investment in life sciences companies in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia specifically, uh, much of which was focused on cell and gene therapy companies. So I think there was about 980 million uh, directly focused on cell and gene therapy companies. So really significant uh, work being done right now to, uh, to, to invest in the companies working on these, these uh, novel medicines and cures. And, and I think what's, what's really interesting here is that we're starting to see that move out into the, the CRO space, into the CMO space. So that, that investment is really triggering a lot of tangential um, uh, uh, effects, uh, really positive effects, obviously. Uh, real estate. Obviously, there's a, a important development here in that all of the life sciences investment has triggered the need for lab space. Um, you know, Philadelphia actually, in particular, is facing a little bit of a dearth of lab space in that um, it's just growing. Uh, I think more rapidly than maybe we can get buildings up. Um, but it's really exciting in that um, the region is now home to 36 cell and gene therapy R&D companies. Uh, the the workforce for cell and gene therapy uh, is projected to grow significantly. Um, in the next 10 years. And, you know, the research institutions I mentioned before continue to, to work on that basic science to move uh, this process forward. So really exciting things happening in, in Pennsylvania in terms of cell and gene, uh, gene therapy. And, and really, you know, those, I'll, I'll sit on this just for a second in that um, we've gotten a lot of 
working with the, the Pennsylvania Office of International Business Development, we have had a lot of conversations with, with contract manufacturers in particular about locating in, in Pennsylvania and then in Philadelphia specifically. And a lot of that is due to the cell and gene therapy growth that has happened and is projected to happen over the next decade. So right now, uh, as these companies really look to scale up their operations and scale up manufacturing in particular, there's a lot of manufacturers interested in using their platform to help companies do that. So there's been a lot of interest in manufacturing of these, these novel therapies and cures in the region. Uh, I know it's, a, it's something we wanna continue to have conversations about, and that actually leads me to my next slide, which is <clears throat> related to workforce. We wanna ensure Pennsylvania has a workforce to, uh, to take on those, uh, those opportunities that exist. And like I said, a lot of those are coming from, uh, from international partners. We've seen, like I said, we've seen a lot of international interest in locating facilities here to help move the manufacturing space uh, forward for cell and gene therapy. So I don't wanna read through all of these slides, but again, you see some of the companies, uh, active companies in the, in the workforce um, space and, and really wanting to ensure that there's a, a, a talent pool that exists here that we can continue to draw on. And then the other thing I'll note is that, um, again, uh, the, the, the estimates for growth in the next 10 years uh, are significant, about 35 to 94%, which could ultimately account for about 11,274 uh, jobs. So really, really exciting uh, opportunities for growth and for partnerships with, um, with companies in, uh, around the world. But in Korea, obviously, we, we love to see um, greater partnerships as this, as this particular sector of the life sciences really continues to expand and grow. Uh, beyond that, you know, just kind of reinforcing again some of the things I already noted, there's been a lot of uh, uh, initial public offerings uh, in the life sciences space in 2020. Um, 86 IPOs nationally and six uh, IPOs in 2020 in Philadelphia in particular. So <clears throat> again, just continuing to highlight the, the growth we've seen in, in the region over the years and the opportunity for uh, engagement both nationally or domestically and internationally uh, for our industry. Uh, again, uh, going back to the uh, venture capital uh, investments in the biosciences, uh, you can see that these numbers continue to increase year over year. Uh, I suspect in 2020, you'll see something very similar. I'll note that uh, in uh, a particular uh, interest to our members is something that Pennsylvania offers called the Research and Development Tax Credit. This tax credit is capped at $55 million in the Commonwealth. Um, but just last year in 2020, it saw a... Uh, um, uh, requests totaling uh, about $200 million. So we know that there is a significant amount of money spent on research and development in the Commonwealth in 2020. So I suspect that we'll see similar, uh, similar numbers from the venture capital side as <clears throat> some of the information that I pointed out in my earlier slides uh, indicates that uh, growth continues to accelerate in this, in this field. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, that's it for, for my presentation in terms of slides, but I, I do want to um, thank the, I really want to thank uh, Ken uh, and the Korean Biotech Association for including Life Sciences Pennsylvania in this discussion or in this seminar. I think, um, uh, you know, Pennsylvania in particular, um, you know, given its proximity to Washington, D.C., and to New York. So our regulatory markets and our financial markets is well positioned for continued growth. Uh, and you know, you know, the Eastern seaboard in general is, uh, is very exciting, uh, is a very exciting place right now in the life sciences from Boston, all the way down to Raleigh in North Carolina. Um, not that I love to give a ton of attention to some of our, our competitor states. Um, it really is an exciting time for the life sciences. And there are going to be a lot of opportunities that continue to, to come out uh, uh, for, uh, for partnerships um, with our international, uh, international organizations and companies. And um, I, I, you know, I hope that if you have any interest in, uh, in understanding more about the life sciences, uh, particularly in Pennsylvania, you will reach out to me. My email is here and I look forward to, uh, to working with you. So thank you again and have a great day.